Hi, my name is Erica Voss, and I'm going to be talking to you about lessons learned converting patient level data to the OMOP common data model to support the COVID-19 crisis. And the way I'm going to work through this presentation is I'm going to talk about how COVID-19 generated a call for action to not only do research, but also a call for data. When we get that data, we need to think about the ETL, and thus we had an opportunity to measure our ETL process and think about how can we improve it. So in March, unfortunately, we were not able to have our European symposium. So instead, we had a study-a-thon. And what we wanted to do was generate evidence to support this global pandemic. And during the study-a-thon, what we did was we did characterizations on different patient populations. We did population level effect estimations. And we did patient level prediction. But when you do those types of analysis, the backbone of this are phenotypes. And so we need to have really good definitions in order to do this type of research. So on my screen, I just have an example of one of the many definitions that were created during this study thon, and I'm gonna walk through it. So this definition, looking for COVID-19 patients, started by looking for outpatient or emergency room visits. During that visit, we wanted to see certain conditions or measurements happening. We also wanted the, be the, the patients to be a certain age. We also didn't want to see COVID-like symptoms before the index. And we wanted the people to have a certain amount of time within the database. And so this was an example of a COVID-19 uh, phenotype that was used during the study-a-thon. Now, while phenotypes might be the backbone of doing studies, ultimately you need data. So how does this phenotype translate to the common data model? So if you want to know somebody's 18 years or older, you need the person table. If you want to know how much time somebody has in the database, you need the observation period table. If you want to know the visit types, outpatient, ER, you need visit occurrence. And of course, you need conditions, procedures, measurements, and observations. So just this one phenotype, we basically need all the tables in the CDM. So that means if we're thinking about an ETL process, we have to think about the whole thing, not just a select few uh, tables. So at the same time as the study-a-thon, Eden put out a call for data, and this was the COVID-19 rapid collaboration call. And what Eden wanted to do was pro provide financial and technical support for data partners who are interested in um, converting their data into the, co uh, COVID, uh, into the common data model to support COVID-19 research. We had 75 applications for that grant, and we were able to award 25 data partners the grant. There were 11 countries in those 25 data partners, and we had over 115 million patient lives represented. Okay, so now that we have access to data, we need to transform it into the common data model. And we have a process that we think is best practice, but we've never measured this. So let me talk through the process that we've used for years now. So if you have a data set and you're ready to convert it, the first thing you need to do is characterize it. And we use a tool called White Rabbit. It's going to tell you about the tables and the columns and what the data looks like. Once you've characterized it, you're going to then design your ETL. So you use rabbit and a hat to actually uh, do the design. While you're doing the design, you're probably going to find a couple scenarios where the vocabularies you need aren't in the OMAP vocabulary and you need to do a mapping to standard terminologies. Once you're done with both the vocabulary mapping and the ETL design, you're going to then in implement your ETL. Once you have your first CDM, you're going to take a look at how, it, how it's done by uh, looking through Achilles. That will give you a high level characterization so you can see if something looks funky. But also we have our data quality dashboard and this literally gives you a score of how well you did. And when you got things wrong, it's going to tell you. So you can choose to either address it or say my data set doesn't need that. When you've gone through this process, you'll land to a place with a CDM that you feel comfortable for research. So that's our process. Again, we've not measured this yet. Additionally, uh, we recommend a certain group of people come to the team to, to do this process. So we recommend people with medical knowledge so that they can help with the coding and also understanding um, how the data is being generated. We want people with data expertise. We want people who actually touch and use the data all the time. They'll be able to help in the process of designing the ETL. 
Having people with technical expertise is important too. We want people who know about doing ETLs. That will make the process a lot easier. And finally, we want to know where we're going. So somebody who has experience with the CDM makes this process a lot easier. So uh, of our 25 data partners, what we did is we, uh, uh, of 15, I have data on uh, what these data partners had in terms of the skills that they brought to the table to do the conversions. And so this is a heat map, and when you see the lighter colors, this means that a data partner was either less experienced or less proficient in an area. And if you see a darker color, it means they were more experienced or more proficient. So for example, if we say we want to have somebody with medical knowledge, about half of our data partners have that skill, either a clinician or an epidemiologist, somebody who knows about the data in that way. Um, and so it has yet to be seen of how important this role actually helps the data partner getting to their ETL. As far as data ex experience, I've been very um, happy with that almost all of our data partners are either proficient or expert level in their data. And the cases where they're not, it's because a new uh, COVID-19 registry type data was generated. So they just were not experienced with it yet because it was brand new. We also want with the people with the technical expertise, we see that almost all of our data partners had experience in the ETL, and this has definitely played out in our conversions, that people are really comfortable with the idea of converting data. As far as CDM experience, almost none of our data partners had this experience, but in this Eden rapid collaboration call, we were providing people to the team who had that experience already. So there was a task force uh, given to each data partner to help them through that process. So we still have a lot of work to do and we've uh, made a lot of lessons learned. So what we've learned so far uh, is that we definitely saw by this rapid collaboration call that there's high interest in this, that there's a recognized need for improved interoperability of health data in Europe. So people want to uh, transform their data into, uh, into the common data model. Also, in going through the ETL process, one of the things that we're seeing that impacts timelines is uh, health data research maturity. And what I mean by this is if your data is already in close to a research ready format, it makes it easier to get to the common data model. If your data is across 30 servers in this hundreds of tables, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but the CDM is going to make it easier to use that data moving forward. And finally, uh, there's definitely a recognition that we're building our research network. So as the data partners move through the process, they're starting to see the value of, that's gained by the standardization. And they see that the, uh, the analytic tools that they gain access to by having their data in the common data model, as well as the fact that now they can participate in network-based research. So we have a lot more to go, and these are just some of our lessons learned so far. Thank you for listening to my talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium.